Welcome to Have You Not Read, a podcast seeking to answer questions from the text of Scripture for the honor of Christ and the edification of the saints. I'm Dylan Hamilton, and with me is Michael Durham, David Casson, Andrew Hudson. Before we dig into our topic, we humbly ask for you to rate, review, and share the podcast. Thank you. And today, we're starting out with a question from our audience, which actually our audience is whoever goes in and asks a question on our website, which can be found in the show notes after the show. The first question is, how should one understand the man Paul refers to as one was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words? Second Corinthians 12, 2 through 4. You want to take a shot, Michael? Sure. So uh, reading the text will be helpful here. And it uh, is interesting to go ahead and read chapter 11 and so on, but we'll just start with verse 1 in Second Corinthians 12. It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who, 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And then Paul goes on to talk about the thorn in the flesh, another famous passage about Paul. He's already said that he'd rather talk about his infirmities and his weaknesses, and how the Lord has been dealing with Paul in his life. Uh, I think that the key word in this passage is not necessarily, you know, who is this man and third heaven and, and so on. This is all very interesting, but why does he even bring it up? I mean, that that's the real question here. And I think the key word both in the latter part of 2 Corinthians 11 and here throughout 2 Corinthians 12 is boasting. So who's boasting? Why is Paul compelled to boast but not boast? <laughs> uh, why all the boasting? What can, we, what can we see from the text? Any ideas? Well, there is, uh, just because I take a, a, the alternate view um, from you that Paul is actually speaking of himself ah. here, where he has before gone in and says, if anyone has any reason to, you know, glory or anyone to, you know, it, it's, it would be me, you know, Hebrew of the Hebrews, this, this, but all these things I count as rubbish. Right. So he has the suffering for Christ and the th- and, and things that he is in, in enduring, um, but he's boasting of his infirmities. And then he talks about more of his infirmities and the things that, um, the, 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 the messenger of Satan that that's buffeting his flesh. So he's talking about before this and after this about himself and what God is doing in him and why. So it feels like, feels like, did I actually say that? You said it. I did. It looks like and appears that Paul is maintaining the same context. He's talking about himself, but what God is doing in him. If anybody has any reason to boast, it'd be Paul, but he doesn't because who am I? I'm no one except what Christ has made me. Here's another example of what Christ has made me. Isn't it time stamp though? Like, can we can we kind of verify? Fourteen years, years ago, ago? right? Yeah, There's like, something very specific here, isn't there? Yeah. So here's here's where I'm coming from. Um, when Paul says in the text, verse five, after you know all the things that happened to this man, verse five he says, "Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast." Now, I'm just trying to roll with Paul's audience, and are they going to pick up on some sort of subtle maneuver here where Paul is uh, in, engaging with some uh, subtle satire, <clears throat> kind of poking at those who would boast about their special experiences and trying to get at something? And but he really is him, but it's but he's saying it in this way. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's very possible they're that sophisticated and so on. And if it is Paul, great. If it's somebody that Paul sat down and had some hummus with, 
that's great. But why does he bring it up? He's bringing it up because he's trying to model for the folks there in Corinth that we should not be running around boasting about our special spiritual experiences, or shall we say, here are all my credentials. All right? Didn't Jesus teach us a different way? How did Jesus deal with his disciples when they were arguing who is the greatest? What, what, what did he do? Now, that happened more than once. So what do, you, what do you remember about Jesus dealing with his disciples when they're trying to push those credentials and experiences? What did he do? He described to them who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, which is the, the least. It's the least of these, a servant. He put a child in the midst of them. He said, don't let anyone call you rabbi or leader. Don't take on those fancy names. Don't let anyone call you padre, pope, right? El papa. <laughs> yeah, el papa. <laughs> el jefe. Yeah. <laughs> don't let anybody call you that. Uh, you're a brother, right? So he had he was always pushing against his disciples. His disciples were getting really fat heads because they were casting out demons and they were healing people in the name of Jesus and they were preaching with authority and seeing amazing things happen and and they were they were taking up these spiritual experiences and comparing themselves with each other and saying, "Oh, which one is the greatest?" And Jesus is saying, "You're you're totally missing it here." So Paul is doing that very same pastoral maneuver here in Corinth. And if you go back and you check what's going on at the end of 2 Corinthians 10, and you keep on reading all the way through 2 Corinthians 11, here, here's the heart of Paul. This is why he even brings it up. And again, is it Paul? I don't know. Do we have to know? I don't think so. But obviously, Paul knows about this amazing spiritual experience that trumps everybody else's boast in Corinth. Like, nobody can get even close to this. <laughs> um so if, if we need to boast here, I've got a trump card that nobody can beat. But why are we even doing that? We should be boasting about our weaknesses and our infirmities and show, show how needy we are and how dependent we are on God. And he's trying to move them away from those who are boasting big time in themselves. And the reason why for that is in, at the beginning of 2 Corinthians 11. He says, oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, which is his talking about boasting. And indeed, you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Like his, his concern is that Satan will deceive the bride of the second Adam just as he did with the first Adam. Now verse 4, For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. How are, how are they being convinced to believe in a different Jesus and a different gospel and receive a different spirit than before? Because these guys coming in with this false message have credentials and spiritual experiences and they're boasting in themselves rather than boasting in the Lord. And I think that's why that's what lays in the background of why Paul even brings this thing up. I was in the spirit and received my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's, a kind my, of, that's kind my of, third PhD. That's from kind of Cambridge, what he's kind know? of talking about, right? Like using that instead of instead of giving what was received without any sort of boast it the focus gets changed from christ to me right exactly okay i mean if this was an experience that paul had 14 years earlier if it is indeed paul which is the 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 view that i take based upon the for and after he is modeling for them saying that look i had this 14 years ago and i did mention it once because it's that's not what gives me credibility it's Christ is the focus here. And if indeed the Corinthians are being led astray by those who have these experiences, and I know I, we, we, know, we, we know the story of the, you know, the little boy who, who died and went to heaven and he wrote a book and started a movement. I mean, there's, those things are, it's almost a byword now. So it's happening today. So Paul comes in with this, talking about he's glorying his infirmities. He has these 
you know, all, all of these things that have happened to him, but, but we glory in Christ, we glory in Christ. And by the way, <laughs> you know, 14 years ago, I had this, but you heard me mention it? No, because it, that's not the issue. Here's the issue. Let's talk more about the thorn in the flesh. So, Andrew, um, what do you think about people basing their their spiritual pontifications based upon their own personal experiences? Well, that's kind of my background. I grew up in a charismatic church. Uh, I was going to say, how else would you get on Sid Roth's show to sell your how to break soul ties and generational curses if it wasn't for all these experiences that you can share with others? For the audience that cannot see what's happening, everyone in the room cringed at that. <laughs> that and hurt. it's happening every single week. And there's a new set of, or a new batch of teaching for people to purchase to now get to the next level or to get what they want or to be free from addictions because of a, a soul tie that happened three generations ago. Andrew, I'm glad that you have a facility with all this because I don't know if I had the, I had the stomach to catch up on all the. That just sounds awful. It is. It is. I uh, used I used to preach monthly, once a month at a at a at a charismatic uh, group, and they called themselves a church. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that are they were just trying to get some kind of stability in their life, and and it was a mess. It was just a mess up there, and I would go and preach monthly. But the the spirit in the room, it was the most oppressive place I've ever been, <laughs> and I wanted to, I wanted to help, but it was very difficult to be there. It was full of something else other than the spirit. Uh, yeah, it was full of um, their worship was like the, they came for their worship experience, um, which was the music that they were blaring through their little metal building, and it was overwhelming it was so loud you couldn't hear yourself think um you know jesus culture wailing uh, repeated mantras you know it was very yeah eastern hmm. uh, pantheistic kind of approach did that type of charismata look like what was described in the book of corinthians hmm. uh, about how to do, how the gifts and workings of the holy spirit how they are to be done in order? No, it wasn't orderly. It wasn't orderly. And even in this very small group, they kept on having fractures and divisions uh, because everybody needed their spotlight and they weren't getting enough spotlight. And it was, it was very tragic. And the health of it was very clear when you saw there was a young girl <clears throat> who was a part of the group and she died just suddenly. And they never actually found out the reason for her death. And the the church and the, the group there and then the funeral afterwards and so on they just had no way of handling it well they just they didn't and and you can imagine paul just praying and laboring for the corinthian church trying to ground them in uh, the word and not in experiences but there are a lot of um artistic people that were drawn to this church. I, I, I find, so like in school, I always found that kids that were creative in any sort of way or, or gifted in that way were extremely drawn and especially musically creative. They were extremely drawn to charismatic movements or things that I saw were really lifting up their gifting as something higher than the rest of the gifting in, in the room. And I, I've noticed that as well, like even with some of my writers groups where kids were like that and like they wanted churches that would vaunt like poetry or create some sort of creative out output with words. And I never had that attraction to it. And maybe it's because I wasn't as good as words with words as they were, but I see people being drawn to places where their gifting is vaunted at least a little bit. Yeah, the, there really was a hunger for the spotlight, hmm. and and then whatever, and they, everyone was trying to find their particular niche, and then to emphasize the need to have that you know put up front, because again, if your if your spirituality, if your religious experience, if if everything is based upon your uh, experiences, if your faith is based upon your experiences, then you have to pursue as many experiences as you possibly can. Hmm. 
And that's that's is 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 it exhausting? What's mm. next? <laughs> What's next? Yeah. What's next? Constantly. Yes. The dopamine hits. <laughs> Got to have those. Well, and that's the thing. And of course, these folks were, you know, <clears throat> struggling with the after effects of going through a life of addicted to drugs, mm. and so they were struggling with all kinds of things. Uh, but there was just such a sharp contrast between what they were doing at you know the first forty five minutes to an hour of the get together versus what I was doing when I got up there to read the Bible and then exposit the text and try to apply it under the authority of Christ. There was, it was such a sharp contrast. It, it's, um, it's, it was, it's like a Paul Washer at a youth conference kind of a thing where they're, they're doing this whole emotional ramping up kind of a thing and they're just going nuts. And then he gets up there to, you know, preach the gospel and you know, and basically advance the fear of the Lord upon everyone, and it's so disjointed. It's just very disjointed. So there's, of course, we know some of the things that are going on in in the <clears throat> life of Corinth. So obviously, Paul's wanting to ground them in something other than boasting in spiritual experiences. And and again, I think it's an interesting point that David brings up about, you know, this was not brought up for fourteen years let's say, like it never got mentioned, okay? <clears throat> and then all of a sudden, Paul trots it out, and I think the point is well made. There's always somebody else who could trump your spiritual experience. Well, what then? Do they get to define what the gospel is now and what the truth is now? Come on. On that note, what does it mean for being whether in the body or whether out of the body, and it's mentioned basically twice is that death because it it does say caught up now is this a catching up in spirit or this person died and then returned so because yeah whether Paul the, was stoned and they thought he was dead right <laughs> so <clears throat> whether in the body or out of the body he doesn't even know um and he says it more than once and there's all sorts of things that are just you can't hardly define it's when you think about what what Paul describes here, we see similarities with the experience of John the Apostle, who was caught up to the third heaven, not the sky, not the sphere of the stars, but into the throne room of God, into the presence of God, the, the very same place where Christ ascended and was taken. Uh, from his disciples and hidden by the Shekinah glory cloud and entered uh, into the throne room of heaven. Well, what Paul describes here is something that we get to see in detail when we read Revelation. And at first we read that John is on the Isle of Patmos and he sees, he hears Christ and then he sees Christ. And we could say that John has some sense about himself that he's in the body. Okay. Who knows what happens when he goes to the throne room of heaven and all sorts of very interesting things start happening. Is John aware of his body at some of these points? Maybe at some points, maybe not at other points. So who knows? It's intentionally vague because that was the actual experience. It was vague. Okay. So I think, I think that's what it, it's, it's hard to explain. I think it's part of what Paul is saying. Do we have a reformed version of this? where there's boasting in the camp with credentials and I am of so-and-so and so-and-so -so baptized me or trained me or taught me. We remember that from early in Corinthians, right? There was a controversy and schisms about following persons based on various experiences and so on. And this is a, this is a great temptation to believers. You know, I was there at Shepherd's Conference when xyz went down mm -hmm. <laughs> you know or uh, i've been to all the t4gs or i've been i've been to the conferences that are way more holy than t4g um and it's and so on um so there's there's that there's you know, i read the institutes every year you know th those kinds of things i'm i'm, I'm more I'm more familiar with so on and so forth so that kind of bragging and then this is you know, part of it 
and I and I'm totally not digging at David, but the main reading of this has been Paul. This is Paul saying that it's it's Paul, but not saying it's Paul. Which okay, but I don't know if there is room for a humble brag when he's trying to and note, but he is modeling not to boast about experiences, and he is saying, "Bear with me with a little folly." So I'm I'm still okay with that reading if it is Paul, but at the same time. There is the humble brag pitfall in reform camp, is there not? Where there's discussion going on, maybe some pastoral application needing to be made, and all of a sudden someone drops a you know ten dollar word to sum up the situation, or they mention by the by, oh, this was in this obscure passage of this obscure Puritan. Uh, that I read five years ago and still remember, you know, I'm not bragging, but I'm bragging kind of thing. So yeah, we're, we're tempted to, to do that. And uh, that can make uh, conversations kind of insufferable, especially for folks who come in uh, to groups and they, and they want to fellowship with followers of Jesus and they can't keep up with the, you know, with the, with the lore, the references. Y- yeah, yeah, exactly. What's this paradise he's caught up into? Well, he says in parallel, you think about the way that the Hebrew mind works. So he says in verse 3, and such a one was caught up into the third heaven. Okay. And then in verse 4, how he was caught up into paradise. So with the Hebrew parallelism, just the, just the natural way of writing, the natural way of uh, expressing oneself, I would say that whatever the third heaven is, is the paradise. And vice versa. And if we've already identified the third heaven as uh, heaven proper in terms of being uh, with God in his presence, what John experienced, what uh, the saints experience upon death, as Paul has already, Paul says elsewhere, he desires this blessing of being absent from the body and present with the Lord. I mean, that's, that's a good thing that that would be what he is talking about, caught up into paradise. In him saying, heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter, there were some inexpressible words uttered around John, and John was going to write them down, and then he was said, no, you can't write that down. So to, to me, this is a similar experience to that of the Apostle John. Was it, is it too far out there to say that this guy that he knows is John? Or is, it, is the timeline way, way off? That would blow so many people's minds. <laughs> there was an overlap of churches during this minis- time in ministry as far as the locations of the churches. Yes. So the que- so it's, it's interesting when you read the narrative of the book of Revelation, John is on the Isle of Patmos. Okay. The tradition is that he was exiled there by Caesar because of the sudden surge of opposition to Christians and so on. But when you look at Patmos in relationship to the churches of Asia Minor, very close proximity there. It wouldn't be out of, out of the realm of possibility that John was there on the Isle of Patmos, maybe preaching the gospel. He's there on the Lord's day. Was he hoping to be a part of a, a service together and break bread? with believers. I mean, we don't, do we have any clear vector about how, why he's there, right? So it's just been held in the last 150 years that Revelation was, you know, written in the reign of Diocletian, you know, in the 90s and so on. However, you know, it could be that it was written uh, during the uh, realm of Nero or maybe even, what, 14 years prior to Second Corinthians? <laughs> That's, that. I think that's, uh, I don't know, I don't know, does anybody have that theory? That's pretty exciting. I don't have the, like, timeline. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 need, I, need, I need a timeline of... of yeah, we're talking, stuff. like, maybe 40 AD right. at that point. Right. Like, because I think Corinthians are written in the 50s, so... <laughs> well, and, and even, even if, like, say, he gets this account from John, right? John may not have written it down right away, right? It could have been later that he penned it, or... Sure. Yeah. Sure, and, and so who, who knows? Uh, sure, some of this does fit John pretty right. well. Right. 
<laughs> pretty well. But I, as far as the dating and the, you know, 14 years ago and so on and so forth, when it is the more credentialed you are and the more uh, highbrow elite Bible scholar you are, um, the more fashionable it is to push all of the dates of all the writings of Scripture farther and farther out later and later and later. That's just the trend. And the there are a few counter proposals to that, like Richard Bauckham and so on, who uh, find reasons to propose that these things were written earlier. But gr- greatly, the trend is to push it all late. I'm I'm convinced that everything in the New Testament was written prior to AD seventy. The motivation is usually to account for prophecy. It's uh, whether you're looking at uh, Daniel. It's it's all written written late. Why? Because it's accurate. Yeah. Uh, how could that there's, be? There's Deutero Isaiah. Are you sure? Because yeah, it, it's it's too accurate to be biblical. Because it talks about Cyrus. Right. So it, if it's written early, that means it's true, because prophecy came true. If it's written late, then you can discount it. So that that the motivation is to undermine the biblical text. It's not the word of God, but it contains the word of God. When we say it's inspired, we mean it's that it's 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 really an inspiring work. I just want to smack the guy in the face. That's actually not what it says, but that would be illegal. So I think Karl Barth was a sad individual who really did want to believe the gospel, but not really. Do you know who Karl Barth's favorite preacher was? Martin Lloyd Jones. Really? Yeah. Very spoke very very highly about Martin Lloyd Jones. Loved to visit. Loved to hear him preach. Did not repent and believe though. Carl F. H. Henry once asked Carl Bart uh, in an interview whether he believed that the tomb was empty where Jesus' body had been laid. But in other words, was there an actual physical resurrection? Yeah, with physical bodily, resurrection. Yeah, a bodily resurrection that Jesus actually died. He was actually laid in the tomb. He actually rose from the dead. And uh, Karl Barth considered the question to be nonsensical. What does that have to do with anything? Hmm. An empty tomb is not the issue, right? I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah, it's about encountering. I, I beg to differ. <laughs> it's about encountering the word of God in these collected myths. Yeah, the, the empty tomb is the issue. It's the core issue. Yeah, exactly. Boasting of oneself is antithetical to John's ministry of decrease and Christ's increase. I must decrease he must increase puffing up oneself is the opposite of that yeah that's that's a good point i mean that's isn't everything in the gospel and how it works out we see in the new testament designed to strip us of boasting i mean it, when you read uh, romans 3 so that no man may boast jesus tells his disciples you are to be the least in the kingdom of heaven Tells all his followers, take up your cross. You die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. The Paul counting all of his credentials as a dunghill. And just time after time after time, it's about stripping away all those prefixes, suffixes, initials, and everything that we would throw around our names so that there's no name but the name of Christ written on our foreheads and our hands. Amen to that gives you a different kind of context when you think of being a kingdom of priests as well whereas a worldly king would have all these suffixes and prefixes i think it it allows us to redefine through the bible our preconceptions of what a king is as well well we have ran out of time for this question for today so we're going to go around the horn and we're going to say what we're thankful for michael we'll we'll start with you Well, I am thankful for the the truth time and again that I have to keep on applying to myself, but (laughs) that uh, God does not get tired of our praying. He doesn't get wore out from hearing uh, from us that because of the, the full, robust nature of Christ's redemption, that we can come boldly, persistently, that we we come humbly, but asking for everything that we need, because that's exactly what we were instructed to do. And 
that it, it, it folds into this boasting thing wherein we are not to be boasting about our own strength, but we are to be depending on the strength of the Lord. That Christian maturity is not becoming more independent, but becoming more dependent. And so just thankful for the gift of prayer, thankful to come to my Heavenly Father again and again, know that I can just lay everything out in its specific nature. Well, I am uh, I'm thankful for our uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting. I drove about four hours yesterday after flying about three, three legs at and getting up at around 4 a.m. yesterday. So backing up, it was a long day <clears throat> and, uh, and driving in and all I wanted to do, and I admit it, all I wanted to do was get, get home um, and go, go straight home. And yeah. it was about, oh, 515 or so when everybody's gathering here, getting ready to break bread quite, quite literally. And um, my daughter texts me and says, hey, we're, we're going to we're, we're going to church. When are you going to be here in time? It's like, I, I don't know if I'm going to be there, be there in time. It says, OK, well, you, you can meet us there. And I'm like, I'm looking at the GPS. I'm like. And I'm just, I'm just dragging. I mean, I'm running on, on, you know, caffeine and hope at this point. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's all right. I, I, I would like to, I'd like to go. And then I show up and everyone's glad to see me. And I have been gone for two weeks because I got caught in a, in an ice storm and I couldn't get home. The same snowstorm that you guys had up here. And, and I got to see, got to see everybody and all of the, I guess the tiredness sort of, you know, abated for a bit. And we just got to, you know, I, 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 I had missed, I'd missed the meals. Like, Oh, that's okay. You know, uh, after, after uh, prayer time and, and, and fellowship time, <laughs> Jana would not let me get out of here without taking some enchiladas. <laughs> um, so she's just forcing these on me and I, I tore into those things. I oh, was yeah. so hungry last night. Um, but it was just, I was fed. I was, I was, uh, I was fed with fellowship. I was fed with seeing my family and I was, I was fed literally. And it was just, it was just a reminder. It says this was, it was good. It was good. Even though I, I had had a long day, it was a kind of tired work day where you, you know, you're, you're satisfied, you're tired after a, a long day where you actually were, were working and traveling and, 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 and doing, doing the things you've been called to do. And, but you know, you're kind of longing for bed and it was uh, it was really nice. So I'm very thankful for our Wednesday Wednesday prayer time. Very thankful for all the people that um, prepare food, and I'm thankful for my my family uh, encouraging me to make a little pit stop on the way home to see our uh, church family. I am thankful that I don't have to worry about what tomorrow holds. We see Jesus telling us not to be worried about such things but to prioritize, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that, as he puts it, the Gentiles worry about. You know, I'm so worried about that type of stuff, but he puts into proper perspective the role of food, the usefulness for clothing and, and drink, that it, I don't have to worry about such things. And that is a comfort. Amen. I'm thankful to, to God for his adding to us at all times, even when it's just things like bringing home a set of chickens and adding a coop to the yard and stuff like that. He plays no zero-sum games. He's only adding to us and refining us. And when he, even when he takes away, uh, in the case of lo loss or losing someone or a miscarriage or something like that, it's always adding some refinement to you and your family and it also adds to the love that you learn to express to the ones that you do have. So I'm very, very thankful to his adding out of the abundance of his kindness to our households. Uh, it's very uh, reassuring, comforting, but it's also just a magnification of his character. And you learn and you get to see how he is and it lets you know how you need to be so i'm very thankful for that we are 
Also, very thankful for all of our listeners who tune in week to week. We appreciate your listening to this content, and we ask that you please rate, share, and review. And we hope you'll join us again when we meet to answer common questions and objections with Have You Not Read?